topic that will be that will be covered. The, the topic and the discussion is called Bet building better worlds through game culturalization, <laughs> and it's an honor for us to welcome all the way from the United States of America just for this specific session, Miss Kate Edwards. <laughs> she's the executive director of the Global Game Jam. She's the CEO. She's been the head of the I. She's been the head of the in International Game Developers Association 2012 and 2013. And she is a lot, she has achieved a lot. I just finished up, she was, just one last thing, she was termed as one of the top 10 women in games by Forbes in 2013 and 2014. So please give her a huge round of applause. Okay, here we go. All right, so I'm going to be, later I'm going to be showing a lot of examples with the images. So feel free to stand up if you can't see this, because you'll want to see some of the images. So... Um, or if you want to come up over here or something, feel free to do that. You're not going to bother me. So I'm just, I'm just letting you know in advance that as I get through this talk, I will get to a part where I have a lot of examples to make sure that the world they're building is going to be compatible with the different cultures they want to sell their game to. And so I did start this work at Microsoft many years ago because Microsoft was making a lot of mistakes, and you'll see some of those mistakes later in this talk. Um, and so as I go through this, one thing I think I want to remind people is that games, of course, are ancient. Games are as old as us, as civilization, as humanity. And a lot of times people forget this because they say, well, video games are new and they're special. It's like, they are special, but games are absolutely not new. We know this. I mean, you know, this region of the world is responsible for actually starting games in, our, in human society. This region, uh, you know, Iran... Uh, Egypt, all of that, all across this region is where gaming became part of human society. And these are some of the examples um, from those times. When, to me, a video game, what, it, what is it really? Well, to me, it's a collaboratively created, interactive form of digital art. That's my definition for a video game. And I think all of this is important because collaborative means we tend to do it in teams. Some people do it by themselves, but most of the games are made by a team. It's an interactive form, of, and it is art. It is art whether or not people recognize it or not. And what I love about games is that they are currently, in my view, the current evolution of human narrative. So all of these other forms of media, all of which still exist, all of these forms of media have been created throughout human history, and they've all been used to translate stories from one generation to another. That's how we, we, used, we used to do it by language, we did it by visual art, even way back to the days of cave paintings. But now, video games right now, we are the ones who are defining how human beings tell stories to one another. And that to me is super exciting. Video games are a massive economic force, as we all know. And now this data here is almost three years old already, but I love this chart because it shows how much games make compared to film, and books, and music, and all these other forms of creative media. And this is amazing. I mean, look at that. Games make so much money. So what's interesting, too, if you took every form of live sports, like FIFA and all that stuff, we still make more money than all live sports in the world. So video games are a massive economic force. And so that is something for us to be proud of as well. We need to embrace that, and especially when we're talking to politicians and the public and even our own parents when they say this is a waste of your life it's like no I'm doing actually one of the most this is one of the most profitable jobs in the whole creative industry in the world in all of entertainment more than film more than music and all these other forms and that's really exciting so when we make these games you know all these worlds that we create whether it's something super detailed like Skyrim if you've played Skyrim it's got all kinds of detail in it uh, games like Halo, um, you know, it takes place in our real world, but it takes place in the far future. Um, even games like No Man's Sky, where the entire universe is procedurally generated. So, but even that, the pre procedural generation has to be based on rules. And so they've used based rules on our real world, how plants grow and how planets form. And so that's how they wrote the code to generate planets in this game. Even stuff like this, this is a world, there is a narrative behind this, even though it's just a bunch of characters who fight each other, but there is a narrative behind this. Um, and of course, games like Grand Theft Auto, this game, I'm actually from Los Angeles originally, and I love what they did with this game, because it is such a great parody of Los Angeles. Um, they, they nailed it, and it's amazing to me that these British guys created LA in such perfect detail. 
Um, and it's just, it's a, an amazing example of, of what I call hyper-realism. This is close to reality, but it's not reality. Um, and then, of course, things like Assassin's Creed, where we take the real world, we take real history, but we lay on top of it a fictional narrative about the assassins and the Templars and all that kind of stuff. Um, even Minecraft, this is about world building. There's a narrative in this game, but the game itself is really about world building. It teaches people resource management and how to build structures and everything. And a lot of people also forget that even what people consider to be like simple games, like casual games, these are also complex worlds that the game creator makes. Now, on the player side, they, might, they may not see it as complex, but we know, as everyone in this room who's worked on a game, you know that there's a lot of depth behind your decision making, and not all of that depth actually shows up on the final game. But things like Limbo um, is, is a world in itself, and of course, even Angry Birds. People think, well, this is just a fun, silly game. Well, it's like, well, no, there's a whole narrative about pigs versus birds, and there's destruction, and there's all this other stuff going on. And of course, Rovio has explored this relationship in other media, like comic books and movies and things. Um, so they've taken advantage of that. So my inspiration for world building and for getting into cartography was this, was this map. And I'm sure most of you recognize what this is. This is the map of Middle Earth. This is actually the original artwork that Tolkien did um, with notes that, on there. Um, and so his map is incredibly detailed, and what I loved about it is that it brought to life a completely fictional universe. And how did he do it? He used what we recognize as real-world tools. Like, he made a map, and we're all familiar with, with how maps work. And so when we look at a map of, like, Pakistan, for example, we consider that to be reality, because it's a map that's reflecting what's out there on the ground here. And in the same way, we, we have that same perception of fictional universes as well. And I find that fascinating that every single fantasy author since Tolkien, they also have used a map in their books. So like if you've read like the Chronicles of Narnia, and they, they he, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis put a map in there to orient you, um, or like Game of Thrones. This is actually a Google Maps version of Game, Game of Thrones, of Westeros. Um, or, you know, Dinotopia, there's um, the, the Thomas Covenant series, if you've ever read those fantasy books. Um, and um, what the author is often doing when they're pr pr uh, providing a map in their work is it's, a, it's trying to give you a sense of reality. It's almost as if the author is saying, I was there. I took a journey to this place, and I, I detailed it in a map, and I'm bringing the map back to you so you can see everything I saw, and then I wrote a story about what I found there. And it, try, it actually try, it, it tries to ground the narrative in a sense of reality, even its complete fiction. And a lot of times in our games, we're doing the same thing. We use cues from our world and things that people recognize in order to bring a sense of reality to the game when we're building the world. Um, what I find interesting is that like when filmmaking, when they go out and they use a real location in the world to film a movie, that real location then be, kind of takes on the fictional uh, identity. So like for example, this is a map of all the places that were used to film Star Wars, at least episodes one through seven. And so you can see all these locations around the world where they filmed Star Wars. And you can ignore the Jedi Pi population, that doesn't matter. We're not concerned about that right now. And so it's interesting that a lot of these sites for Star Wars fans, like I'm a huge Star Wars geek, I love Star Wars, and for me, when I go to these sites, it's almost like a religious experience. But there's a certain reality, fictional reality. So when you build the world using this real place, it actually, now that real place also takes on a certain fictional reality of its own. Or like in Dubrovnik, when I was there for the reboot conference, I recreate scenes from Game of Thrones with a friend of mine. Um, and then um, I, was, I went to Ireland right before Gamescom in 2018, and you might recognize this island. This is the island that they used the latest Star Wars trilogy where Luke Skywalker was hiding out. And so if you're a geek like me, you go out to this island and you recreate scenes from the movie. So, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> but um, because for me, this place has taken on a new form of reality. It's not, it's not, it's, called, it's an island called Skellig Michael off the southeast coast of Ireland, but for me it's called Octo. That's where Luke Skywalker is hiding out. Um, and I'm a huge geek, you know, just so you know that. So you may have guessed I'm already a geek, but I'm, a, I'm really a geek. So, you know, I, I cosplay 
And um, the, there's a reason I do it is because my daughter is a is, she's a costume designer. So that's her on the right, and so we cosplay together. We and this actually has relevance to this talk. I'm not just showing these pictures for fun. I'll, I'll, but I'll come back to this later. But being a geek and absorbing a lot of science fiction and fantasy content and working in the game industry really helps me in my work. But I'll explain later why that is. So what's important to think about is the global game industry, as we know, is a very global industry. This is the revenue from last year, 152 billion US worldwide, which is a ridiculous amount of money. Um, you can see how the growth around the world um, there's still a tremendous amount of growth in a lot of regions around the world, like over 10%, well, except for Asia Pacific, but it's still almost 8%. Um, and what's amazing is that last year, China finally passed the United States as being the number one gaming market in the world. Um, China is also passing the U.S. this year as being the number one movie-consuming market in the world. And that's kind of shifting what people are doing in terms of making their games. And they're starting to realize that when, because I meet a lot of game developers in a lot of markets around the world, and what do they want to do? Most of them say, I want to make my game and I want to make sure it gets sold in North America because that's where all the money is. Well, there is money there, but there's also money in Asia, there's money in Latin America, there's money in all these other countries of the world. In fact, in a lot of these markets, um, let me see, did I put that slide up? No. Um, in some of these markets, like in, for example, in Nigeria, year over year growth has been over 20% in games. That's ridiculous amount of growth. Vietnam has been like 15%. Um, you know, so some of these markets that nobody really thinks about usually when they're creating a game because they want to create it for North America or Western Europe, um, these other markets which are really hungry for games and most all of it is on mobile because people cannot afford PC or console in these markets. I can tell you a lot of developers I talk to, they don't even think about developing anything for Africa. They don't think about developing for Southeast Asia. They just want to sell it where the money is. But the reality is the money is, all, the money is everywhere um, because game playing is happening all, all over the world. So um, now localization and culturalization, I know, I'm sure most all of you know what localization is. Or you've heard the term. Now from my perspective, localization is mostly about language translation. So you're, you're making your game in English or whatever language you want to make it in and then you translate it to another language and then you sell it in another market. And that's really important. You still want to do that. That's, you know, like when I meet indie developers in the US, I encourage them to at least localize into Spanish because there are 30% of people in the US speak Spanish. And then Spanish also opens up the game to the entire Western Hemisphere, except for Brazil, because that's Portuguese. But that's a huge market. And so by just localizing to one additional language besides English, they, they instantly opened their game to this massive new market. Um, now, culturalization, though, is different. This is where we don't, it's not just about language, it's more about designing the content for the local market. So it's, it's a deeper level of looking at the game and thinking about how does my gameplay work in this other culture? How is my subject matter going to work? Are people going to like this particular topic? Maybe you're dealing with a certain kind of historical issue or religious issue or something else, and you have to think about is the, is the topic of my game going to work? in these different places around the world. And more and more companies are thinking about this level because they realize tr just translating is not enough. Because so many people play games today across so many cultures that they want their games to appeal at like a more deep, deeper emotional level. And you have to get beyond just the language to reach that emotional level. So let me give you an example between the difference. So this is the Kit Kat candy bar. And this is a strawberry version of the candy bar. So the top one is from Canada, and you can see the wrapper, it's, fr it's in English and French. And then the bottom one is Japanese, and it's in Japanese. So basically these are the exact same candy bar, but they're in different wrappers. So that's basically what localization is to me. Same product, different language. Now in Japan though, the Kit Kat candy bar has become a cultural phenomenon like nowhere else in the world. And there's two reasons for that. Num the first reason is because the term Kit Kat the name of the candy bar is very similar to a Japanese phrase, which is kirukatsu. And then kirukatsu in Japanese is sort of this, it's a very positive phrase that kind of means like, I am victorious, I am the winner. You know, it's a very good phrase that Japanese people would say. And so Kit Kat, they lucked out because their name happened to be like kirukatsu. And so the company decided to actually use that to their advantage. And what they did is they actually culturalized the Kit Kat bar 
in such a way that they made flavors that correspond to what people like in different regions of Japan. So in the North Island of Hokkaido, for example, they like yubari melon and baked corn. So I don't, to me, a baked corn Kit Kat sounds disgusting, but I'm not Japanese. So, uh, or in Tokyo, they like sweet potato and soybean Kit Kat bars. You can get a map that shows you where to collect the different flavors around the country. Now, this is the second uh, thing that made this so successful is that Japan has, uh, as part of their culture, they're very much a collector culture. And if th that's why we should not be surprised like why Pokemon came from Japan. Mm -hmm. Because Pokemon, and gotta, gotta catch them all, that whole idea, that's very a very Japanese thing. So like when they release Kit Kat bars like this all around the country, it compels Japanese people to go collect all the candy bars. And at this point, they've been doing this for over 10 years, there's been over 600 unique flavors of Kit Kat bars because they, they sometimes make them for certain holidays. And if you know about Japan, they've got like ridiculous amount of holidays, like many, many holidays. Um, so, so my point though, is that they took a simple candy bar, which for most of us is just a candy bar, and in Japan they turned it into an entirely different cultural phenomenon, and it works with Japan because they used the Japanese cultural values to make it work. Um, so I find that really fascinating. And that's kind of the difference between localization and culturalization. Now, when I'm doing culturalization work, there's kind of two types that I do. One is called reactive culturalization. So that's usually what I get paid to do. So that's when a company comes to me and they say, we're afraid that something in our game is going to make a government angry and they're going to ban our game or consumers are going to get really pissed off. They're going to go on Twitter and get angry at us. So we need you to find things that might be a problem. So that's reactive culturalization. The other part is proactive. So what that means is basically we look for ways to enhance the content for a specific market or for, or for a specific re uh, region. So for example, when I worked on Forza Motorsports, for the different languages, like for Italian, the cars that you could drive in Forza Motorsports, the default set of cars, and I don't know why this is moving, don't go yet, um, <laughs> the default set of cars corresponded to the language and to what we knew people in that market liked. So like Italian, the Italian version of Forza had mostly Italian sports cars. The American English version had like Mustang, Corvettes, like muscle cars like, uh, that a lot of Americans like to drive. German, the German version had a lot of German cars, BMWs, Mercedes and all that. Of course, you could download all the cars from online, you could get DLC, but, um, but you know, the default set corresponded to the cultural interests in the different markets. So that's, that's proactive culturalization. Here's an example. Both of these examples apply to next door to India. So this is from Fallout 3. I don't, you've probably heard of that game. I worked on Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas. And in this game, they had this two-headed Brahmin bull that would wander around the post-apocalyptic landscape. And you could eat it, and it was radioactive. It was obviously it's de deformed because it has two heads. Now, the, this is the whole reason why the game did not release in India. Because there were fears that this was going to offend uh, people who practice Hinduism because the Brahmin is sacred to the Hindu faith. And there's actual laws in India that protect real Brahmin bulls from being harmed. And so there was a fear that those laws could be used against a virtual version of a bull. And so they didn't want to take the risk. Now, we tried to convince the developer to turn it into something else, like a two-headed, my poorly photoshopped two-headed horse. Um, and this would have worked. This would have been fine in India. But they, but they didn't want to do it because they felt that the Indian market was not important enough. You know, so that's why they did not sell this game in India. Um, and now, similarly, when Marvel created this version of the the uh, the very culturalized version of Spider-Man, um, the initial re the initial reaction to this was really positive because people said, "Hey, this is kind of cool that you would make a culturalized version of Spider-Man." But the problem was is that people ultimately what they wanted because Spider-Man is so popular and everyone knows who Spider-Man is. And so what they really wanted, this is an example where they, they, wanted, they thought that culturalization would work, but what people really wanted was localization. They wanted to like, give us the you know, 100 languages of India, give us all those versions of Peter Parker in New York City. That's what we really want. We don't need this Indian version of Spider-Man because we think it's kind of weird. Um, so, so that was kind of an example where they tried to do the right thing, and I think it's really cool that they made the attempt, but ultimately the market said, we just want Peter Parker. We don't need some other character. 
So basically what my job entails is I, I try and work with the game creators and the worlds they're making, and I try and see how can I make those compatible with the worldviews into which the, the game is going to be sold. So this is an exercise which is kind of like splicing genetics together where I'm trying to get to culturalized content. So content that's actually going to work in the different markets. And so I'm working in that zone right there where content is either going to be compatible or incompatible with that local culture. And that's what I look for. That's the job that I do when I work on all of these games. So um, typically what happens with culturalization um, in the product development cycle, and this is a very simplified version of product development, um, but typically what happens is that localization happens later because they have to wait for the content to be complete, which we know is kind of a joke. Content's never complete in the game, but it has to be done enough so that they can do the translation so they don't have to go back and translate again. But culturalization, a lot of my work happens early. So for example, when I work on a Bioware game, like I just started my work on Dragon Age 4 last month. And so we, Bioware, I've been working with them on all their stuff for the last, what, 17 years or so. And so they show me the ver earliest version of the script. They show me the early concept art. And so my, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to understand what world are you creating, who's in this world, what do they do, what's the player doing, what's the player experience, um, are there factions, are there religions, are there governments, are there, is there an economic system? I need to understand all those things that are being put into this world very early on because they might be making decisions very early that could be a problem right from the start. It's not very expensive to fix it compared to fixing it later when the game is almost done, that's when you don't want my help because <laughs> then I, I, that happens, I get called into a game project, they said, yeah, we, somebody said you should look at this because it might be a problem and then if I determine that it is a problem, it's a huge problem because it's really expensive at that point to go change a whole bunch of things in the game. Um, now when, the, when we're doing this work, there's many things we have to think about. It's not just simply looking at something and saying yes or no. Um, first of all, we have to think about the high-level corporate values and goals. And this is something that involves every single person who makes games, whether you're an indie developer or whether you're Microsoft or Sony or one of the big companies. What are your values and goals? So, for example, if a government pushes back on your game and because they said, let's say, for example, you showed Taiwan as an independent country in your game, even in a fictitious science fiction future, but you're just, you know, you wanted to show Taiwan as its own country, you will not sell in China, period. You're not going to sell any games in China, and you may not sell any games from not just that game, any game you make in the future, because oftentimes governments don't forget this stuff. So the next time you release a different game, they'll say, oh yeah, we remember, you're, you're the ones who showed Taiwan as independent. No, we're not selling your game here. Um, so you have to think about that. What's your value? Or do you want to, you know, do you want to push that? Or do you want to like say, no, we'll change it because we don't want to get in trouble with China? Um, the other thing is you have to think about the context in which content is created is very important. And what I mean here is that every single one of us is biased. We all came from a different walk of life. We all see the world in a certain way. And we have to understand that every one of us has a bias. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's just human nature. We all have a bias. I grew up in Southern California and I've lived in Seattle. So I've lived on the west coast of the US my entire life. And even though I travel the world, I grew up with that kind of mindset, which is different from people who live on the East Coast of the US. It's not the same, because Americans are surprised, they're very different. Um, so, and that, that also matters from country to country, and I'll actually have a good example of that later. Also, the business strategy for the vertical. So if you're a big company like Sony or Microsoft, you don't just make games, you make electronics, you make other software. And so you have to think about how, was our, how are we positioning our games versus other things that we create. The other thing is of the market strategy. So most companies have a strategy for each market or each region, which is different. So like, what do you want to achieve in China versus what do you want to achieve in South Asia, for example? And the market strategy for a specific game, because that can also be different, because we know that different markets like different kinds of games. Like, as I'll mention in an example soon, like Korea likes RTS games, real-time strategy games, like StarCraft. They love those kinds of games, where in other markets they're not as popular. And then finally, there's the changing geopolitical and cultural and ethical factors, because the world is dynamic, and as we know, all it takes is one regime change, like a new government, 
and the laws can change, or rules can change for what you can sell or not sell. It happens, it happens. So for example, two years ago, Germany, they changed the rules around Nazi symbology in games. So they had a very strict ban. You could not show swastikas, you could not show Nazis in any game at all. But two years ago, they changed it. So this is an example from Wolfenstein 2, where the, the pictures on the left is what like the US saw that version, but the ones on the right is what you saw in Germany. So like they did not show the Nazi swastika, you know, they did not show Hitler with a mustache, because there's no way you could tell that's Hitler without a mustache, right? So it's just kind of silly. But but though but now they've relaxed those laws, so now you can actually show Nazi symbology for better or worse. Um, but anyway. Um, so things do change, and like if you've been following what happened with Blizzard recently, with the whole their whole uh, thing about free speech in Hong Kong, this was a huge disaster for Blizzard, and they were totally unprepared for this. I don't care what they said; they were so unprepared. They really made fools of themselves with this issue. But this is this is where real world politics, the whole Hong Kong and China issue, intersected with Blizzard's business, and it's something that they were not really thinking about. So. Let's talk about world building. So some of the core aspects of world building. One is setting the context. Does it place, take place in the real world or, or the fictional world? The complexity, so how much world do you need to realize? How much world do you need to build? And then also the structure, the, how you create the elements that go into your game world. So really close to reality, but it's not reality. But it's close, because everything about it is mostly real. But then something like Skyrim is all the way fictional. It has nothing to do with our universe. It's completely unreal. Um, and when I say realization, I want to make sure I'm clear that I'm talking about, I'm not talking about realism. So realism is like making it photorealistic, making it look like it's a photograph and all that. That's not what I'm talking about. When I say realization, I mean how much world do you need to make to serve the goals of your game? And that realization goal is determined by two things. So one is the narrative goal. So what's the narrative of your game? And again, like I mentioned earlier, even a simple casual game can have a narrative. So basically, what is the game about? And then what does the player do? So what's the experience of the player? So those two things together often help dictate how much world you need to build to make the narrative clear and to make the experience a good one for the player. And um, I'll mention later, one of the biggest problems I've seen in a lot of games I've worked on is that people tend to make too much. They build too much world when they don't really need to, and they go far beyond just serving the narrative and the experience. But we'll talk about that in a bit. So there's some tools that are useful in, when, in building worlds. So one is what I call building cultural evidence, and I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna talk about all of these. Um, ensuring logical consistency, uh, using complex systems or implying them with what I call topology, and then establishing familiarity, familiarity um, so let me just talk about what, what, I'm, what I'm saying. So cultural evidence, what do I mean by that? So if you're building a world, uh, whatever it might be, let's say it's a, a simple fantasy world, um, there's going to be things in the environment and, and things with the characters that kind of convey culture. It's going to be the costumes your characters wear. It's going to be symbols that are on their costumes. It might be banners that are hanging off of buildings. It'll be the architectural style of the buildings. It'll be objects that are sitting in the town, if, it, if there even is a town. There's going to be everything, every element that kind of conveys a sense of culture in the game is, is something that you're going to create. That's called cultural evidence. And so my goal is always to make sure you create the most minimal amount of content to convey that culture that you want. You, and this is, again, kind of trying to restrain yourself from making too much stuff when you don't really need to. Um, and this is the highest risk, risk activity I've seen in all the games I've worked on, is once you get past that concept phase that I was mentioning earlier, and all the artists and the writers and everybody just kind of goes and does what they do best, which they're amazing at their work. But when, for example, I have a lot of issues when artists are kind of heads down just making stuff every day, and a lot of times they have a checklist where they're, they're, in, they're up against a really bad timeline, so they like I, they come in that morning and say I, there's 50 things I need to make today. It's like ah you know how am I going to do this? So they just make stuff and they just keep making it. But that's a lot of times where they're drawing from their subconscious and they're just creating stuff that could be potentially problematic. And a lot of times nobody's checking that to ask them, hey wait a minute, what what is that supposed to mean? Or why did you make it look like that? Or what was your inspiration for that costume? 
And a lot of times there's not somebody kind of looking at it from a higher level to ask the question about the creative process. And the problem is that a lot of creative folks, they take offense when you ask them that question. Like I get a lot of people angry at me when I, when I ask them, well, why did you create it that way? Well, like, well, who are you? You know, who are you to tell me that, how to create stuff? You're not, you're not an artist, you're not a writer. It's like, who are you? I'm like, no, my job is to make sure you're making the right decisions around what you're creating and making sure that it serves the narrative and it serves the experience. And if it isn't, then it's my job to flag it and to say, I need to ask you why. Um, so two things that are really important is don't be lazy. You wanna make sure you always create with a purpose. And so no matter what you're creating, make sure that you're really intentful about it. And I, I'll have a couple examples. The other thing is somebody needs to ask those hard, challenging questions. And it's, again, it's not challenging your skill, it's just asking, why did you make it this way? Or does that serve the point of the game that we're trying to make? Um, and here's an example of that. So this is from the game Jade Empire that I worked on for Bioware many years ago. So this was a, this was a if you've never played this game, it was sort of an uh, Asian fantasy. Basically the culture in this game originally was like 80% Chinese, it was 10% Japanese, and then like 5% Korean and 5% South Asia, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. And uh, it was a very weird mix. Well, I don't know why they would mix it up like that, but that was my job to try and fix that. One of the things they did, so this world in Jade Empire has nothing to do with this world at all. It's a complete fantasy. And yet in this corridor, what the artists did is they put the, the uh, prayer wheels from Tibetan Buddhism. So originally they looked like this. Now, why would these be in this environment? There, there's no reason for these to be in this fictional environment. And so unfortunately, we found it too late, and we didn't have time to remove the 3D model. So you can see what we did is we skinned it with like this glowing blue stuff to make it look like energy cylinders. Um, and so this is an example where the artist was just kind of creating stuff, and they were thinking, well, it's an Asian environment, and Tibetan prayer wheels, you, that's something that you will see. In an, in an Asian environment, although that's you know very specific. Um, so they just said, well, I'm just gonna put it in the environment, because why not? But that's not appropriate, because there's no reason why you would take a sacred artifact from our world like that and put it into a game like this. Um, so logical consistency is another very important concept with world building. So this is where you wanna make sure that anything you do in your game has logical rules that exist. So when you create something, why is it there? Like, it, does it make sense to have it there? Even in Tolkien's fantasy universe, like, there is magic, there's dragons, there's other things that exist, but if you've read, like, all of his books, like the Silmarillion and everything, you understand that there's actually rules behind why the magic is there, why the dragons are there, why all these weird creatures exist, and they actually make sense. So he built the world out, and he built it with a certain kind of logic, even though it involves something like magic. And that's something that we need to do in the games that we make because players, one of the things they respond to really well is a sense of reality. Even if, even if it's a game like Skyrim or something that's complete fantasy, what makes it work is that the rules in the game feel like the rules that we deal with every day in our lives. There's physics, there's gravity, there's weather, there's all these things that work and they, they kind of work in a system um, just like the real world and it makes sense. And so you have to kind of convey that in your games as well. So we don't want there to be any contradiction between the narrative intent of the world and the content that, you got, that goes into it. So here's another example that's sort of similar to the, to the one I just gave, but this is, a, this is a game called Cameo. It came out on the original Xbox. And this is, again, was a complete fantasy world. It has nothing to do with our universe. Well, in the game, they, this road, as you can see, they're, they're, um, the, it, there was a necessity to have grave markers on the side of the road. So what did the artists do? They put wooden crosses. And I'm like, so I asked the artist, I'm like, so what are those supposed to be? And they said, well, they're graves. And I said, well, but why would they be wooden crosses? There's no Christianity in this universe. And, and so, and not to mention the fact that not every culture uses a wooden cross, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, so they were like, well, what, and this is what they said to me when I, when I asked them, they said, well, what else should I use? I'm like, I don't know, you get hired to be a creative artist, maybe you create something that's actually gonna fit this universe and it will be logically consistent because a wooden cross is not logically consistent with this universe, but maybe something else would be. So that's where the creative, that's again, this is also an example of lazy creativity. 
they just used a wooden cross because it was easy. You know, they think it's something that everybody would, would recognize, but everyone in the world doesn't recognize this as a grave marker. Um, so yeah, so that's something that had to be changed, and that's also something that's not logically consistent. Another concept that's really helpful in world building is, is this idea of topology. And you've probably heard this term before, like they use it in network science, like for internet, you know, the network topology. What this means, and that we use it in geography as well, topology is not topography. Topography is like elevation and distance. Topology is about connectedness. So for example, right now we have a topological relationship. I'm a speaker, you're an audience. That's a topological relationship. You know, or uh, you know, the speaker and the microphone. That's a topological relationship. So there's, it's connectivity. So how do things relate to each other? That's really what it's all about. It has nothing to do with distance. And so this can apply to anything in your game. It can apply to ideas. It can apply to other cultures in the game. You can imply things that exist in your world without actually building those things. And I'll give you an example of how that works. Um, yeah, it can, it can convey a much bigger universe without actually building the universe. So when I worked on the original Halo games, um, for example, if you played Halo, you may have come across these terminals. And so on the Halo ring, when you're running around, you're, this, the Halo ring was built by the Forerunners, an alien race that is mentioned only briefly in the original game, and you don't know anything about them, really. All you see is the, what, the, the artifact they left behind, which is the big Halo ring. But if you go to these terminals, if you find these terminals in the game and interact with them, it actually brings up a little text screen where you can read about them. So it tells you more of the backstory of who the Forerunners were and what happened on the Halo rings. And it actually deepens the story quite a bit in a really simple way. You didn't have to build a whole other level. You didn't have to make another character. All you had to do was have a pop-up screen with text on it. And it just kind of tells the player they can read it for like one minute. And they're like, wow, OK, now I understand more about what's going on. Um, and that, I thought, was a really effective use of topology. So all they had to do was make a point where you can kind of explore a little additional part of the world um, without actually having to build all that other stuff uh, in worlds like this. They really love to be able to have that discovery and to learn more. Um, if you saw the movie Rogue One, they did this also really well because this character, Chirrut Imwe, they called him a guardian of the wills, W-H-I-L-L-S. Now, I'm old enough, I saw the original Star Wars when I was 12 years old, 1977. Uh, yeah, you do the math. Um, so, it, we, we knew as Star Wars fans, way back then, they were using the term wills in the original draft of the Star Wars script. So George Lucas had used that term, and so for all of us who are Star Wars geeks for all these years, that term has been really special. We knew it had something to do with Star Wars lore, and yet they used it in Rogue One, only briefly, they said it once. They said he's a guardian of the wills. And we're like, for some of us, we were freaking out in the theater like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they used that term. So it actually is real. Um, but then they never explain it. And in a similar way, they have shots where like they show on the planet Jedi where you see this huge mountain range, which is actually a fallen Jedi statue. And that's like, so what happened here? I don't know, but just showing it raises a lot of questions about the whole backstory of this world and all the other things that may have happened here, but they don't explain it, and they don't need to. All it does is kind of entice you. It entices you to know, want to know more and to really kind of deepens what may have happened on this place. So I thought that was a really effective use of topology. Um, now, geographers like myself, why are we good at world building? Well, because we spend our time deconstructing this world. That's what we do for a living. So we spend all of our time finding out, finding out what's out here in the world, and we put it into a geographic information system, and so we, we put, actually put different thematic layers together. So you can see like that's an example where we have like land use, elevation, um, you know, roads, all that kind of stuff, and so we put it in a GIS system, and that's how we do analysis. So we, we, can, like an, we can analyze different layers between each other, and so that's how a lot of Spatial understanding is, is, that's how we do it today, rather than using paper maps. And so when we do cartography, like when I, I still do a lot of projects involving cartography, cartography is all about world rebuilding. Because every single map you've ever seen is a version of the world that is obviously very generalized, it's very simplified because you can't put everything on the map, and so that's a world that's been rebuilt, and oftentimes the cartography 
is a certain kind of fiction because the cartography is often made by somebody with a specific purpose in mind. Like if you see a Chinese map, they show stuff that they don't actually own. So like the whole South China Sea. So, but that's fictional. That's what I call the geopolitical imagination of the government. So, um, so th yeah, so what I've done is oftentimes when I work with game developers, I help them think like this because when you're building a world, there's all kinds of potential layers you can use to build a world. So this is just a few examples. Um, this is a very generalized list. If I made this a detailed list, this would be like going to the center of the earth. So, but like some of the examples here, like climatology, um, you know, hydrology, plate tectonics, gravity, you know, a lot of games usually have gravity, um, you know, all the way down to like language systems, history, politics, religious systems, economics, all of that. So for example, climatology. I've worked on games where they spent a lot of time building a weather system, and the weather system had nothing to do with the game. All it was was just rain falling on you, but it didn't change your behavior, it didn't change the gameplay. But then if you've played Breath of the Wild, the, the Zelda game on the Switch, that, the weather in that game directly impacts everything you do. Like lightning will hit you and almost kill you. Well, it will kill you. Um, you know, the water affects you as the rain is falling on you. You will get too cold if you're up in the mountains and you're like going through the snow. You actually, your health is going down because you're freezing to death. Um, so the weather system in that game has a direct impact on the gameplay, so they obviously thought it through very, very well. Um, but I often, like I say, I see game developers, like say, we're going to make an economy in our game. So they make this very elaborate economic system, but then it never really, you, the players never use it. They might, hear a, they might hear a character talk about it, but then you never use it. And so it's like, well, why did you go through all that time and trouble to make an economic system, but then you didn't use it? So that, again, is one of those issues where you have to really think hard about what do you really need an economic system in your game or not. And so you have to think um, before you build. Um, so I want to talk about the most problematic layers that I've had to deal with in my work. And some of these are probably pretty obvious, so like the use of history, the use of faith, um, inclusion and exclusion, and I will, I will d uh, describe all of these, uh, intercultural dissonance, and then what the geopolitical imagination issue. So history. So we know that historical memory is very persistent in a lot of markets. I mean, certainly here, where your culture stretches back millennia, it's a lot different from the United States, where our culture, we don't really have a culture, but whatever it is, the McDonald's culture, but we... Um, I mean, we're only, the country is like, what, only 250 years old or so, something like that? It's not very old at all. It's like nothing, you know? So, so a lot of game developers in the U.S., their perspective on history is not as deep and appreciative as, the, like, someone creating a game here or in China or elsewhere. And so we have to sometimes remember that. So, like, when Age of Empires came out in Korea, and I worked on all these original Age of Empires, this is one of the scenarios that we put in the game. So this is the Korean Peninsula right here, and that's Japan over there. And um, so in real history, the Yamatos in Japan invaded the Chozon Empire in the Middle Ages, and they took, basically almost took over the entire Chozon Empire in Korea. And so that's the, they put that scenario in the game, very difficult battle to win, and that's why they put it in the game, because it's really challenging. So we released this game, and on the first day, the Korean government banned it. And the reason is because the Korean Minister of Information said that this never happened. I'm like, well, that's interesting, because every history book we looked at said that this happened. So what are we supposed to do? So here's a good example. Remember the slide about multiple considerations? So here's a good example of that. This is Microsoft 1997. It's growing its games business. It really wants to be successful in games. At that point, the Xbox was barely even a thought. It was just kind of a really small background project. So this was all about PC gaming. We have to grow the PC business. Second thing, Korea. We knew that from market research, Korea is a very popular gaming market. And we all know that it is. And uh, not only that, but real-time strategy games, which is what this was, um, those were also super popular in Korea. And if you know anything about Korean game history, in 1998, one year later, that's when StarCraft came out, and StarCraft became a national phenomenon in Korea. And to this day, over 20 years later, the best StarCraft players in the world are Korean. They always win the StarCraft tournaments all the time. Um, and so we knew that we had to get this game out in Korea, so what are we supposed to do? So what we did is eventually, and I'm sorry this is so low down there, but you can see what we did is we changed history. 
So now the Chozon are invading Japan. And so this created, as you can imagine, this created a big debate on the team, the development team. People are like, this isn't real history. I don't want to work on this game. This is, this is a fraud. You know, why, why are we changing history? Well, first of all, I had to remind them, one of the things, Age of Empires, every battle in Age of Empires is very highly generalized. It's not exact history. I mean, they were inspired by history. They didn't exactly recreate the battle. The other thing is that in some of the technology trees, because every army develops the technology as you play the game, eventually the Aztecs had tanks. The Aztecs never had tanks, I can tell you that. So, um, you know, so that was also not, that was not reality either. The other thing is that a few years earlier, I worked on Encarta Encyclopedia at Microsoft. You may have heard of Encarta. Um, if you were, if, so Encarta was the last major digital, digital encyclopedia before Wikipedia showed up online. And so a lot of people grew up with Encarta Encyclopedia. Now in Encarta, we had different heights for the mountain, Mont Blanc, um, in the French and Italian versions of the encyclopedias because at the time the governments did not agree on the height of the mountain. So that was a few years earlier than this. So if, if we have different heights for a mountain, then w what's the difference? We're basically serving the local expectation. And so the local expectation in Korea is that this never happened and this did. And so we served the local expectation. Now, of course, some people were upset saying, well, this is not reality. It's like, you're right, it's not. And that comes down to the business case. It's like, do you want to sell your game in the market or not? And what are the conditions under which you have to sell the game? And this is one of those times where it's a harsh condition. You have to change reality if you want to sell the game. And of course, a lot of people are finding this out about China these days, because China's restrictions on game content are pretty strong. Um, also, recent history could be sensitive. So this was a game that took place during the, the second Gulf War. And um, a lot of people actually in the, U in the US were very sensitive about this game because a lot of soldiers died on both sides. And they just felt that this is insensitive. Why would you make a game about the Iraq War when at the time when this game was going to come out, it was still going on? Like, that's, not very, that's not a nice thing to do. So they felt it was too recent. So they said, so this game actually never got released. Um, of course, dealing with religious issues in games is all, always sensitive. Um, both of these games had an issue because they each had audio files that had lyrics from the Quran in the game. And so they both had problems because of it, and I don't have the time to go into all the details, but it was really bad problems. Um, you know, Little Big Planet was able to fix it before the game came out. This game on the left that I worked on did not fix it and they purposely released it into the US only, and it became this massive problem, which had me going to Saudi Arabia and elsewhere to do damage control um, way back when in 2004. It was a huge problem. Um, but it just, the biggest issue with these is that somebody who, who chose the audio file, nobody checked to see what the lyrics were saying. That's the one problem. Nobody actually took the, tr the, took the time to verify that the lyrics were from a certain source, and that's a huge problem. So. Um, in Resistance Fall of Man, they recreated the Manchester Cathedral in the UK, um, and they did a beautiful job of recreating it, but the problem is they took the fighting into the church, and the, they actually destroyed part of the church during the fighting, and the Church of England was not happy with this. So they eventually, they asked Sony to basically take it out of the game, but they can't, the game is all done. So what they did is they, they kind of came to an agreement and the Church of England has something they call sacred digital guidelines now. So if you want to use any Church of England facility in a game, you have to get approval, which basically means you're not going to get it. So Hitman, you probably heard about this, or you may have heard where they actually took the action into Amritsar, into the Golden Temple in Amritsar, into the center of the Sikh faith, and then they're killing Sikhs inside the Golden Temple. It's like, that's not cool. You know, that's, that's very insensitive to do that, you know. So um, that got a lot of pushback. Um, or games like Smite, where they took the entire pantheon of Hindu gods and they put them into the game along with the Norse gods and the ancient Egyptian gods. Now, of course, the Norse gods and the ancient Egyptian gods are still worshipped by some people, but very few. Very few people. Whereas the Hindu gods are worshipped by, what, about a billion people? Somewhere like that? So there were a lot of people who were very upset that they actually, the game designers said, well, the Hindu gods and the Norse gods, and all of, they're all the same. We're just going to throw them all together. And that was also seen as very insensitive. Um, inclusion and exclusion, this is basically where people perceive that they are being mistreated or misperceived because of their culture, 
or their ethnicity or their gender, people would reject today. They said that's really insensitive. But what, so the company said, well, oh, by the way, if you, um, the reason it's called Pocket God is because you basically torture these people and you can make the volcano explode and, and kill them. You can um, dangle them over the water and sharks will come up and eat them. Um, and that's what you do. You torture them. That's basically what you do. So um, now the company, they, they were getting a lot of pushback from people from the Pacific Islands. And, um, the, but the company said, well, what do you, this is not real. It's all fictional. But it's like, what is that stone head over there on the island? That's called a moai. It exists only on one place on Earth, and that's Easter Island. And so by using that one artifact, they instantly made this little island. This is Easter Island culture. And so they instantly did make this a real culture by using that artifact. And so in later versions of the game, you can see they actually changed it to some other you know, stone idol over there um, to make it different. So, and that's just one little artifact, but that makes a difference because by seeing that artifact, the people say, well, now you're offending us. Why are you, why are you making us look that way? Um, now, um, wait, yeah, so this other category, intercultural dissonance, this is often where we have tension between different cultures for all kinds of reasons. It could be political, it could be historical. Um, so like th this is an example again from Korea, and it's also Age of Empires, and it's, I'm not picking on Korea, it's just a really good example. So this box art in the days where we used to actually put things on shelves, um, so this box art, they did not want to put it on a shelf in Korea. And the reason is because of the Japanese samurai. Now, the real reason is why this happened when it did uh, about 20 years ago is because in the middle of the Sea of Japan, which is also called the East Sea by Korea, there is a dispute between Japan and Korea. And it's, uh, there's two little rocks called Dokdo in Korea and it's called Takashima in Japanese. And every once in a while, the two countries will have a, like a heightened tension over those, those islands. And so when this game came out, it was at a time when that tension was really high. And so what happened is that retailers in Korea said, I'm not putting anything on my shelf that has anything to do with Japan. So basically, it had nothing to do with the actual game. It had to do with the box art and, and the fact that this game got caught in a geopolitical dispute at the time it was being released. And there's nothing the game developer can do about that. But what they could have done is not use the Japanese samurai. So when the expansion pack to this game came out several months later, you can see most of the world saw that version with Montezuma on it, but in Korea only, we actually put a Korean general on the box because that was kind of, a, it was sort of a way to make up for the samurai and say, we're sorry, we're sorry we put the samurai, we're gonna give you a Korean general because you're special. Um, so another thing like gestures, gestures are extremely culturally uh, specific. So like I worked on all the Dance Central games, and you can see here, like this character here, what he's doing, this motion like this, it's not too much different from doing this, which you probably know what that means. It's, it's the same as this. So, and similarly, over there, what she's doing, she's doing this symbol here, which for most of us is, it means rock on, you know, from rock and roll. Now, if you're from the state of Texas, most people say it means you support the University of Texas, because they have this thing called hook 'em horns because their, their mascot is a bull, so they're like, hook em horns, yeehaw. Um, but in Italy, it means I'm sleeping with your wife. So, yeah, so it's called the cornetta. So you flash that at somebody, and it's, it's you know, you're going to probably get in a fist fight with some Italian. So, um, what's that? Uh, a little bit. So what's interesting about this, when I worked on this game, every, so when the game, it, every time when you play this game, every dance ends and you kind of freeze for a moment. So there's a moment where you freeze and at one point what happens is um, in the original version of the game before it came out, every single dance ended with your hand doing this, exactly like this. Now what that is, that motion, especially when you do it like this, that's called the mozza in Greece. That's exactly the same as this. So, or if you're British, it's this, or Irish, it's this, or in you know, Brazil, it's this, and on and on it goes. So, um, so yeah, can you imagine every single song ends with this, if you're, if you're from Greece, you know, because you're doing this. And so you have to be very sensitive. And so the game developer said, okay, we won't do this, we're going to do this pointing instead. I said, you can't point, that's very rude in a lot of parts of the world, especially East Asia. So I said, just make a fist, like this. 
And they said, well, isn't that sensitive? I said, no, it's sensitive when it's like this. <laughs> this is called the power fist, and it's often associated with like black power and things like that. So <clears throat> do this, and you're fine. So it's, it's so specific, and it's so sensitive. You have to be really careful about using gestures. By the way, at Facebook headquarters, I gave a lecture a few years ago, and I pointed out to them that this which is the corporate symbol, is the same as this in some cultures. So, um, yeah, that's a problem. But they don't care anymore because they're Facebook. So, um, <laughs> what I find interesting, like with gender representation, I think Laura Croft is a really interesting example how her original depiction was considered very sexist, and I, I think it is. But I've worked, on, I've worked on Rise of the Tomb Raider, and I think it's amazing how this character has evolved from being what was considered like a really negative depiction of a woman in games to being actually a very positive example of showing a female character in a game. And part of it is not only because they designed her more realistically, it's also because they got great writers like Rihanna Pratchett to write her, her dialogue and give her more depth and emotional depth as a character. And then finally, stuff like this, um, this kind of self-explanatory. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, this is, this is the kind of thing where they're trying to be clever, but they're too clever. So instead, they just fixed it very quickly. And um, so, and then um, also just, I'm trying to finish up as fast as I can. So um, the other thing is we have to think about is that sometimes this is very, very subtle. So when I was working at Microsoft, we made a special version of Windows for the Indonesian government. And it was, it was going to be given to the Indonesian government. And the desktop image that we were going to put on there was this image. Because it's, it's a scene from Indonesia. Now you can see they're using this filtering effect with the red sky and the bluish at the bottom. Well, I, ought to, I looked at this. And what I saw, because I'm trained to do this kind of work, this is what I saw. The flag of the Netherlands. Now, does anyone know why that's sensitive? Well, Indonesia was a colony of, of the Netherlands until 1949. And so, we're, can you imagine, we're sending this to the government of Indonesia with the Dutch flag laid on top of it. That's not a very sensitive thing to do. Um, well, it's a very insensitive thing to do. Um, you know, so we have to be very careful about this kind of stuff. And I did test this with an Indonesian friend. And I said, what do you see here? And he said, the Dutch flag. I'm like, my case is closed. So, um, so we actually had to fix it. Now, finally, geopolitical imaginations. This is where governments like to reinforce the territory that they own, and they use maps to do it. And um, China is known for doing this very well. Um, like in this game, Hearts of Iron, both of these games were banned in China because Taiwan and Tibet were not being shown as part of Chinese territory. Now, the issue you can obviously see that all of China is divided up. It's divided up into all these pieces because this game is basically like the board game Risk. You're trying to take over the world in pieces. So that's what this game is about. But they didn't like the fact that the pieces are not all showing together. Now, the interesting thing is the game takes place in World War II. You know? Yeah, and so World War II is when this game happens. And yet, the People's Republic of China didn't come into existence until 1949, four years after the war. And so this is China kind of reinforcing their sovereignty before they even existed. And as, of course, if you're watching the news, that's why they're like building fake islands in the South China Sea to basically kind of prove to the world that they own the South China Sea, which they don't. Um, and even in things like in Ninja Gaiden, when I worked on this game, you can see even something like this where you're selecting the country of where you're located. This right here is a very, very strong political statement because you're saying that the Republic of China, which is an alternate term for Taiwan, which is a term that is forbidden in China. You can't say Republic of China for Taiwan. You're saying that ROC is a country, and you're showing them the Taiwan flag, which is also banned in China. So if you use this in your game, you will instantly be banned in China. And so what I did is I did a really easy fix. So we call it country slash region, and we use the name Taiwan because both China and Taiwan, are, they accept the name Taiwan. And I took the flag out because you don't need to show the flag and show the, the name of the, of the place. So it's a very easy fix to do. So now you say, well, is Taiwan a country or a region? That's not your problem. If you're in Taiwan, you could say, I'm a country. If you're in China, you could say, it's a region of China. So if you can push that perception to the user so you don't have to actually assert what it might be, then you're safer that way. 
Um, now, finally, I'm going to wrap up here. So there's a few things to think about as I'm closing. So first of all, I see two key audiences for game content when we're creating our game that we have to think about. One is the intended audience. So those tend to be game players. Those are the people out there who play our games and they love our games and they, they know what games are all about. And um, we don't worry about those people really much, too much. And so the people who actually cause more problems with these kind of issues are the unintended audience, which tend to be politicians and parents who don't play games and religious figures and other people who they'll see one screenshot and they'll be like, <gasps> We can't allow this, this game must be banned because of this one thing that they saw and they didn't even play the game, they didn't experience the game. And so generally the work that I do, proactive culturalization is done to actually help the experience of those who like playing games and reactive culturalization is done to avoid that knee-jerk reaction that happens with people who might see the game out of context. And that's basically how that works. Um, finally, we also have to think about when we distribute games in the cloud, which is the way all games are done today, we have to remember it's instant exposure to a multicultural audience, and there's no way you can take it back. As soon as your content is out there, it is out there forever. And so you have to try and make sure you get it right as best as you can before you release the content, especially because there's a massive online community, social media and all that, who are waiting to either praise you or eat you alive because they don't like what you did. And so that's a very strong force, as we know. And then finally, we also have to think about the mind share issue because a lot of the dynamic I deal with in my work is who is fighting for the mind share of the people in a certain location. This is the reason why the Great Firewall of China exists, for example. They created the Great Firewall because they want to protect their citizens from external influence. And so they don't want people to be influenced by things like video games that might show them a different viewpoint from the government, just like Russia just created their own new firewall as of November last year, which is really sad because that's the absolute wrong direction to go. Uh, but this is something we need to think about when we release our games. Um, now, I, back to my cosplay. So precedence, that's what my cosplay is about. I'm a total geek. I look at a lot of sci-fi and fantasy and all of these things that relate to games. And the reason that helps me so much is because I can go, if I see a game that might be releasing in a market and they're doing something that might be problematic, I can find out like if, they, if that country allowed it in a film or maybe they allowed it in another form of creative media. And so we can often use that, much like a lawyer will look at a previous law case to say, well, wait a minute, you can't rule against us because in... 1989, you said that was fine, and now you're saying it's not fine. Well, I can do the same thing. I can look at other media in that country and say, you actually allowed this to happen in a film, but why are you then banning our game? That doesn't make any sense. And so you can kind of call out a, a, an authority on their inconsistency. And it helps to be a big consumer of all this geek media because that helps me stay informed. Um, and finally, my last, my last point, I know this is a long talk, I, I apologize is about freedom of creativity. I'm a very strong believer in freedom of creativity. So I tell game developers that you really should make the game you want to make. And if you want different markets around the world to accept your creative vision, you have to think about that your game may or may not work in other countries. It may not work in other cultures. If that's important to you, and if you actually want to make money you know, from as many markets as possible, then you have to think about these issues. That's why all of us who make games are kind of somewhere on this, this level here between wanting artistic freedom and also trying to maximize the revenue from our games. And we're always, that's, those are opposing forces often because like indies tend to live in the artistic freedom world where they make the game they want to make and they hope that they'll find a market for it. Whereas large game developers like you know, the Sonys and Microsofts and all that who are making Halo 25 and Call of Duty 30 and all that, whatever, you know, they're over on the maximized revenue side because they're playing it safe. They're, they're just creating basically the same game again. Is Call of Duty, the new Call of Duty, that much different from the last one? Not really. Technically, it's amazing. It's a, like a whole new level of technical arti artistic, you know, expertise. But the game itself, it's not really that much different. It's just serving an audience that already exists. It's not growing the audience very much. And that's fine, there's a place for that. That's like why we have a bajillion Marvel films because there's geeks like me who love Marvel films. But um, 
But, you know, we have to find our place and we have to think what is more important to us. Do I want to make sure my, my artistic vision is what survives or do I really want to just focus on making money above everything? And there's no, that answer is for every one of you to answer for yourself. There's no right answer. It's just we all fall somewhere on that spectrum. So um, that's the, my talk. I'm sorry I went long, but thank you.